Okay, welcome everybody. Um, I'm supposed to be here talking about Java APIs and database scalability, but my favorite soccer team was playing and they won 3-1, so I have, <laughs> I have challenges. What's the priority? So <coughs> I am primarily talking about massive database scalability. So I've got two job titles. One of them means I'm a developer. Um, I write C code for a living. I added 30,000 lines of code to the, the database kernel in version 18.1. The other title means I do PowerPoint. I complain to, to developers. So I sort of have um, a clash there. So we have a very elite audience. This is quite a, a specialized topic. I encourage you to ask questions. Um, that keeps me honest. It keeps you interested. So I need to legally have this for some reason. So what I'm, what I'm gonna be doing is talking about database scalability in general, so it's gonna be very high level. We're gonna get down to code level eventually, so just bear with me. We're gonna talk about vertical scaling, various types of horizontal scaling, the JDBC sharding API, which came out with JDK9, which is pretty cool. And then we're gonna look at, can we do better than that? What is, what's beyond that? So I thought, you know, I'd look at a definition of scalability. So I looked it up on Wikipedia, and I quite frankly didn't understand what it meant. What makes sense to me is when you have a database, if you add more connections, you get more throughput with decent latency. Make sense? Okay, so just, hold on, before we go any further, how many of you are developers? Cool, how many of you DBAs? Okay, so for developers, Java? Okay, cool. Other languages, shout them out. Awesome, anyone else? All right, okay, the boss is here. So first of all, how many of you recognize these guys? <laughs> okay, so the guy on the right, Dilbert, he knows how things work. He knows life is complicated and it's not so simple. The guy on the left, the pointy-headed boss, he doesn't care how things work and quite frankly, he doesn't care. So what we're gonna talk about first is this linear scalability lie. The pointy-head boss would say, you must have linear scalability. Dilbert's gonna say, it's actually more complicated than that. So when we look at a server, any server, you have a scalability curve. To start off with, things scale. Add more connections, you get more throughput. Life is good. If you're lucky, it's linear. After a while, the throughput's gonna drop off and eventually, you know, it's gonna flatten off and eventually it's gonna drop. Corresponding with that, you have increased latency. So most customers want high throughput with low latency. So what I'm claiming is these scalability curves are fundamental. It's not something to do with SQL databases. I'm claiming it happens with all servers. SQL database servers, NoSQL servers, web servers, REST servers, app servers, whatever. They all have the same characteristic. Cool. So what I'm not saying is the curve is the same for all servers. I'm saying they have the same characteristics. So on the left here, server X, it scales up, flattens off, and drops off pretty quickly, and the latency shoots up. Server Y on the right scales faster, it's flat for longer, and then starts to drop off, and has lower latency. So let's just see if you guys understand what I'm showing here. Let's have a show of hands for who you would want server X, okay? Who would want server Y? Okay, so half of you understand what I'm talking about. So the point being, this is the characteristic of performance curve. But it's more complicated than that. It's not just software, it's also hardware. You need hardware to scale as well, and specifically, you need balanced hardware. So let's look at vertical database scaling. Um, you know, I'm not as young as I used to be, over 
20 years ago, I was dealing with stuff on the left-hand side, IBM mainframes. Very impressive, a lot of throughput. I've done far too much work with big Spark servers, HP Superdome servers. This one on the right is interesting. This SGI server has got over 2,000 cores. I was using one of these for the government. Huge number of CPUs, extreme amount of memory, should scale really well. It turned out it didn't actually scale very well for a bunch of different reasons. And not only that, I also found it really slow. So it's not just the CPU, it was only 900 megahertz, but there was some fundamental issues that are going on related to NUMA and the architecture. I'm just gonna go on to that. But fundamentally, these big mainframe style systems all cost over a million dollars, but fundamentally, you can only have so many CPUs and so much memory. So going bigger has its limitations. Specifically, when you've got lots of CPUs, they need to connect to each other. I challenge you to draw an interconnected graph with 32 CPUs. It just gets crazy. But more specifically, when CPUs talk to CPUs, they need a path to do that. When CPUs talk to memory, they take a path to do that. So this CPU talks to the memory on the left, which is fast. When it talks to the memory on the right, it's slower because it's got to go over this interconnect. If you've got two CPU cores, about half the time you're going to get fast local memory. If you've got 32 CPUs, you've got a 1 in 32 chance of getting fast local memory. So what that means is the more CPUs you have, the higher the probability that you're going to do a slow remote access. So basically, more CPU sockets tend to slow you down when accessing memory. So that's called the NUMA effect. To get around these techniques, it gets very expensive. So what it comes down to is fundamentally market share. Most servers have one to two CPUs because they're cheap. The more CPUs you have, the less often there are. So it's a very niche market. So you've got to charge more for them. So a niche market that costs a lot of money. So the point is, this amazing 2048 CPU from SGI, that company went bankrupt because people couldn't buy enough of them. So fundamentally, going big only takes you so far. So to get around that, people have come up with various techniques doing horizontal database scaling. So first of all, I'm going to look at the hardware aspects of it and then the database aspects of it. So if the choice for scaling up was multi-million dollar mainframe style servers, the smart thing to do when you're scaling out horizontally is looking at performance and price performance. So today, that's x86-64 servers running Linux. You know, I'm using an example of Oracle Sun servers, but if it was HP or Lavino, Cisco, Dell, whatever, it's the same sort of characteristics. These cheap servers have minimal NUMA effect because they've usually only got one or two CPU sockets. Because of the commodity, they keep getting cheaper, faster, and more powerful. Moore's law is your friend. This little one you blade has got one and a half terabytes of memory, which is okay. But that memory density is increasing. And tomorrow, there's gonna to be a demo with Intel and Oracle, where we're not looking at dynamic RAM, where we're looking at persistent RAM. That can give you high density, so you can have more, more memory in a small machine, and it's persistent, so things go faster. So there's a talk for that tomorrow. Not only that, you know, they've got two very fast CPUs and eight NVMe disks. So the point is, this little one you blade, which is very cheap, is way faster than those mainframe style systems that I was showing you in terms of performance. They don't scale as well, but they're faster. But instead of just using one of them, let's use lots of them. So these one new servers, you know, in most racks, you can fit 42 of them. That means you're gonna have, in one rack, 84 CPUs and 63 terabytes of memory. So you can be far faster, and quite frankly, have more memory than those main frail mainframe style machines. And every 18 months, these machines are gonna get better. So that was the hardware aspect of it. 
To scale out horizontally, there's various techniques. What a lot of companies did was, let's keep it simple. Databases are complicated. They took existing databases and they used lots of them. They partitioned, you know, they took the software and divided the data up across those databases. So the data is horizontally partitioned across these independent databases. So that's great because you get really good scalability. The problem is how do you query data across those databases? How do you update across those? So in these early sharding databases, that glue layer was done in the application layer. You had to do pass in a thing called a shard key, but more importantly, you had to rewrite your applications to work with the sharded architecture. Also, if you get your sharding key wrong, it's not going to work. So you've got to really understand your application, your data, and what you're doing. So it, it, it tends to be very domain specific. If you need huge scalability, you'll go through these costs to do it. So the advantage was these things can scale really well. So that was the early ones. The more modern ones, that glue that was in the application tier is now pushed down into the database tier. But you still got the fundamental issues. You still need to pass in the shard key, rewrite your apps, get your key, shard key correct. So that's scaling horizontally, sharding with SQL databases. There's another technique. For about the last eight years, really large companies, you know, the Googles, the Yahoos, the Ebays, the Amazon said, hey, we can do the same sort of techniques, but instead of using a SQL relational database, let's keep it simple, um, let's use a NoSQL database, most of which are key value data stores. I'm, I'm generalizing here. Most of those technologies tended to automatically shard the data across those servers, and they had very simple get and put APIs. When it came to transactions, that was hard. So they went, meh, let's have eventual consistency. It'll probably be right. So you're not having acid transactions. Another thing is to be fast and quite frankly to be simple, instead of having tables with joins, they said, let's, let's just denormalize that so we don't need to do joins so it'll be faster. That's great, but there's a cost. Um, the reason they came up with normalized data models was to minimize the amount of data. So the cost is you can get data duplication, which can be huge. But these things do scale very nicely. So just, just to summarize where we're at, you can only scale so far, there's a limit. If you need to go beyond that, you need to scale it horizontally. You can do it with SQL databases. If you shard, there's disadvantages. If you do it no SQL, you can shard, there's slightly less disadvantages. They're both pretty fast. So <coughs> in the talk, I was talking about the, the JDBC 4.3 sharding API. What is this? It's something that came out with JDK 9. So it said, these sharded databases exist. How can we make our life simpler? How can we take advantage of that? But more specifically, how can we do that in a standardized way? So at the metadata level, you can know whether your database is sharded. And you've got two, <coughs> excuse me, um, very important interfaces, the sharding key and the sharding key builder. The point is, this is a mechanism such that you can basically declaratively say what the set of sharding keys are, stick it in an API to pass it through such that your connection can use that. Now, I've got a bunch of code which we may or may not get into, but fundamentally, this is the interface. So you're still using JDBC, but when you're using a key to do your connections and your joins, you're passing this object in to hide or insulate how the underlying database does that. So one of the benefits of this is you've now got a standard database independent way of doing it. Works with JDBC for SQL databases. Works for shared databases. And by the way, it also works with distributed databases. So that's nice from a one API sort of point of view. But there's also a 
a far more useful thing when it comes to scaling is it can make things go a lot faster. If you've got sharded databases, if you're moving data around all the time, you're doing network hops. Network hops slow you down. If you can know where the data is and go directly to that data, you minimize network hops and you go faster. So fundamentally, this technique can minimize network hops to make you go faster to scale more. OK, so the shutting API sounds like it's a good idea, but why don't we have some facts to try and back that up? So we need a benchmark that works for both SQL and NoSQL systems. That benchmark needs to be inherently scalable. Preferably, there's a lot of existing data, so we can do some comparisons. And let's let the vendors do their own benchmarks so that it's optimal results. Any, any ideas what that benchmark could be? Anyone? I'll give you a hint. YCSB. Yahoo Cloud Serving Benchmark. So many years ago, Yahoo had technologies which were good for certain things, and they had some other technologies which were good for certain things, and they asked fundamental decisions like, which is better? It really depends on the workload and your data and your hardware and your environment. So they came up with this benchmark to help figure that out that was representative of the sort of, sort of transactional workloads that they were doing. So some of them were 50-50 you know, reads and writes, some, some of them were mostly read, and some of them were completely read. So they had different workloads. So examples being workload A, B, and C. So Yahoo published this. It's out there on GitHub. Anyone can download it. So the point is the driver and the workload is fixed. The data is fixed. And you can plug in your favorite database to see how they compare. So it's a really nice way of doing apples to apples comparisons. So just show of hands, how many of you are familiar with YCSP? Interesting. OK. So this has been around for about eight years for databases for highly scalable databases. This is kind of the, the thing that people use to compare. So to compare different NoSQL and SQL databases, instead of me, <coughs> excuse me spending a lot of time and effort installing and configuring and benchmarking these things, I thought, shall I be lazy or smart? You choose. I used Google. I looked up the published benchmarks. So for Cassandra, you go to the Cassandra site, Datastacks, they publish numbers. MongoDB, they publish numbers. Skillia, and it's sort of a C++ version of Cassandra. VaultDB, that's actually a SQL database. It's in a memory database. And Aerospike. So these are sort of ordered from slowest to fastest. Um, VaultDB actually got 1.55 million. I rounded it up to six. So the point is, Aerospike, using this YCSB benchmark, the biggest result that they've ever published is 1.6 million operations per second. I'm not saying transactions, because they're not really transactions. They might be reads and updates. They use eventual consistency, so I wouldn't really call it a transaction. The point being, it's a big number, and they used eight machines. So what we're doing is we can compare these different technologies with published numbers. They're not necessarily all on exactly the same hardware. It's just what's published. OK, so they could have chosen any hardware, as many machines as they want. Some of them, Cassandra, you know, it scales really well. Scales to 300 nodes. But each node doesn't actually go that fast. OK, so we've looked at some published results. Now let's compare using JDBC with a SQL database that's using, that's not using the sharding API to, to one that's using the sharding API. So it's the same database. The JDBC program is the same. In one case, the JDBC program is using the sharding API, and in one case, it isn't. And 
<coughs> the one without the shouting API in the red is pretty fast. It's going just over two million operations per second with 16 machines. So that's actually pretty fast. So that's doing network hops, it's doing JDBC against 16 different machines. So it's doing network hops, it needs to figure out where the data is, still going pretty fast. By using the sharding API, you can have more intelligence or knowledge of where the data is. The net effect of that is there's less network hops. Less network hops means you can go faster and scale better. So a SQL database without the sharding API is doing just over two million. With the sharding API, it's just under five million. So, you know, math isn't my strongest point. I would say that the sharding API is better, okay? But more specifically, the SQL database, even without the sharding API, is going faster than all the NoSQL databases. So that's one fact. A SQL database is going faster than NoSQL databases. And if we use an API like the sharding API to give you knowledge of where the data is, you can go significantly faster. So if this was Java 1, I'd be done. It's Java, it goes really fast, we're cool, we're done. But we can do better than that. Oh, just by the way, so if you Java programmers, how many of you do JDBC? Show hands. Okay, this should look pretty familiar. We've got prepared statements, we're setting bind variables, we're executing, we're doing a next on the result set, we're checking error codes, um, we're actually getting the values, we're closing our result set. So that looks pretty much like standard JDBC. Okay, the tricky bit is up here, the statement type, it's getting shutting key by index and we're passing in the key. So that's just the way that Java JDBC has done stuff with the sharding API. The net effect is 99% of your JDBC code has not changed, it's just we, the point you're starting from. So I can go into lots of level of detail for the code, but for the moment I'll just keep it high level. So, sharding API is pretty good. The technique it used was to use knowledge of where the data is to minimize network hops. What if we used more of that knowledge? So this is the same data, down the bottom, the red stuff, that was, not, that was just doing network hops with no knowledge of where the data was. This gray one was using the sharding API. And the big tall one, is that yellow, was it gold? Is using a technique called distribution clauses. Now, once again, I'm not, I'm not that great at math, but the one using dis distribution clauses is significantly faster. So just let's keep this in perspective. The, the smallest one, the red one, is about the same speed, slightly better than the fastest NoSQL database. The one in the middle is using the sharding API, and the distribution clause is using more knowledge of where the data is, significantly faster. So pick your favorite technology. It's red or lower as a scalable database API. <coughs> so fundamentally, we're minimizing network hops to go faster. So what hardware do we use? You know, surprise, I work for Oracle. We're using Oracle hardware. But that's actually irrelevant. If this was a Dell machine or a Lenovo or a Cisco machine, we're going to get the same sort of thing. It's got two Xeons, it's got a bunch of memory, it's got some fast NVMe disks, and it's got two 10 gigabyte Ethernet cards. So it's just a blade. It happens to be running in the Oracle Cloud. And we happen to use 32 of them. So we've got cheap hardware running in a cloud, happens to be Oracle hardware, happens to be the Oracle cloud. 
So just remember, YCSB, 1.6 million. Now, I'm confusing you here. I'm doing a 50% update workload, which is far harder than a 5% update. And we're going pretty fast, and we're scaling quite nicely. If I just explain, so with the YCS benchmark, each record or row is a kilobyte. So you've got 10 fields each for 100 bytes. You've got a million, sorry, 100 million record um, per machine. So I've got 32 times 100 million, a large number of rows. <laughs> and we're using a, a uniform distribution. Um, I'm also using high availability. We've got multiple copies, so we're doing replication, and we're using 32 machines, and we're going pretty fast. So if we go back to the, the comparison, we were doing 5% updates and 95% reads. We're doing 38 million operations per second. So just remember the fastest ever published was a NoSQL one. Fight my mouse here, 1.6 million. We're going significantly faster than that with two machines. So basically, as we add more machines, we get more scalability. So we're going significantly faster, using cheap machines, we're using 32 cheap machines. If we do 100% read, no, up, no updates, we can go really fast, 65 million operations per second, same hardware. So think about your favorite database, how scalable it is. Nothing's close to this technology. So that was one benchmark. I'll just show you another benchmark. So YCSB came from Yahoo. Most database vendors use it because it's a good independent one. This benchmark was developed by Oracle about 20 years ago. Um, a lot of our customers work in telecommunications, so this was representing a telecommunications workload. Um, we ship versions of it in C and Java. There's lots of different variations, but I'm going to look at when we've got 20% updates and 100% reads. So the point is, with 20% updates and 80% reads, we're doing 153 million transactions per second. So my first question would be, why is that so much bigger than the YCSB one? Well, there's two reasons. First of all, instead of having a one kilobyte record or row, it's only 128 bytes. So it's a, it's a narrower table. So the second thing is, this is written in C, specifically in ODBC. So it turns out, with the YCSB benchmark, it's a Java benchmark, the Java language is actually the bottleneck, not the database. So believe it, don't believe it. <laughs> we spend a lot of time figuring that out. When we do it in C with ODBC, we don't have that bottleneck. We can go faster. So 153 million transactions per second, not per minute, per second. Still using 32 of the same machines. If we get rid of the updates and do 100% reads, that's 1.4 billion reads per second. So I'm not very good at math, but that's a lot of zeros. So that's using high availability synchronous replication. So how do we do it? How do we make it go so fast? I'll show you the trick. So this, how many of you, just show of hands, how many of you guys use SQL Developer? OK, cool. So free tool from Oracle, works with Oracle Database, works with a bunch of different technologies. We're looking at a table there. We did it not by using API tricks like the Java JDBC sharding API. We use SQL. Specifically, we focused on SQL optimizations. So the benefit on focusing on SQL and rather than the API that uses it is we can use any language. So we're using SQL, primary keys, foreign keys. So instead of having a NoSQL database with you know, no joins, keep your existing data model. 
do those joins, master detail, detail. Keep your SQL, it will still go fast. Oh, and we did one other thing, we used an in-memory database, it's called Oracle times 10. It's in memory, but we still have acid transactions, we still persist to disk. So times 10 has been around for 20 years, it was an in-memory database that Oracle acquired because it had lower latency than the Oracle database. We can do SQL selects in under two microseconds. What we've been doing for the last couple of years is instead of having one of them, because we could only scale so big, so all those mainframes I showed you earlier, I used times 10 on those mainframes, not the IBM mainframes or the other mainframes. So what we did is we did scale out shared nothing. So the trick with scale out shared nothing is to minimize the number of messages passed. Instead of using an API, which is specific to the language, we did it in SQL, which means we can benefit from all languages. So just jump ahead to that. So we use the Oracle APIs. So whether it's JDBC or ODBC or OCI or PL SQL or ODP.net, um, we use the Oracle APIs. If you like the open source languages, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Python and R. I just use the Oracle drivers for those. Sorry, the, the open source drivers for those. So Node, Ruby, Go, the same drivers that you use for the Oracle database works for this times 10 in memory database, which is scale out, shared nothing. So the point is, this is SQL Developer. Keep your data model, don't change your data model, and we've added a lot of screens, functions, widgets to SQL Developer. So when you connect, instead of connecting to Oracle, there's another tab called times 10, and if it checks out the version, <coughs> it will use these features. So if you like Python, we just use the, the CX driver and your 10S names for about eight years now. There's a special syntax. If we say server equals times 10 direct or client, the Oracle instant client or Oracle client knows how to talk to both times 10 and Oracle. So what is this database? We, t we started off with scaling vertically. You had one database on one machine, and if you gave it lots of CPUs and lots of memory, it got big. If you scaled out horizontally sharding, you had independent databases. Your SQL didn't work across those machines. You were limited in what you could do in selects and updates and inserts and deletes. What if we took the fact that we had many machines but made it look to the developer and the program like it was one database, so you could do all SQL operations. That's what we did, it took many years. So the point is we have a distributed database rather than a shouted database. So it looks like one database, it runs on many databases, it shared nothing, so it can scale. And I've given you evidence of that. It scales better than any other database. So you can connect anywhere, do distributed queries, joins, transactions. If you know how to program against an Oracle database, or MySQL, or SQL Server, or DB2, that model is this model. It's the same. You connect, select, insert, update, delete, commit, rollback. So it's the same mental model. I showed you an example using JDBC. It's just JDBC. It just happens to be running an instant in-memory database, scale out shared nothing, far faster and more scalable than any other database. What about high availability? Logically, we've got a bunch of nodes all connected to each other. In practice, you choose how many copies of your data. In the current version, you can have one or two copies. We're about to release another version where we can have up to five copies. So, arbitrarily, we'll split our databases into four chunks, and we've got two copies of that. You can do updates, inserts, deletes on either side, on the left-hand side or the right-hand side. It doesn't matter. It's active, active. We've got a distributed deadlock detector, so you just do transactions, commit rollback, it'll work. So the point is, you can connect anywhere, initiate transactions from anywhere, 
because it's peer to peer. Everybody's the same. Failures happen. Hardware failures happen, software failures happen. Imagine you're having a bad day and you lost half of your machines. Because we still have a single, you know, a, a surviving copy of A, a surviving copy of B, C and D, we've still got a complete copy of the database. So even though I've lost half of my physical machines, it doesn't matter. You can still keep processing. What if you're having a really bad day? What if you lost both copies of your data? By default, we're going to go stop. We really care about consistency. Let's recover from backup. Or if your application determines that it doesn't matter, let's just keep processing with, in this case, the three quarters of the remaining data, you can do that. That's your choice. So we arbitrarily sp split the database up into four. You can split it into 50. I don't care. That's your choice. So the more machines you have, the more scalability you have. The more machines you have, the more availability you have. What are the machines? They're just cheap Linux machines. So I've been talking about times 10 scale out. We're calling it the world's fastest OLTP database. The two benchmarks are what we're saying is the evidence for that. We've, we've seen nothing that comes close to that. Now, this is a relatively new database, came out in June. China Mobile has been in production since June. They're an existing customer. Um, they've used an earlier version of the Times 10 database. So they're quite a big customer. By big, they've got 902 million subscribers. So just one province in China has got more subscribers or users than all of the US. So they're pretty big. So if you add AT&T and T-Mobile and Verizon, that's only as big as one province in China. So every single province in China uses times 10 because it has a low latency. So China Mobile, because it's so big, because it has so many customers, have been for years sharding their databases because the hardware only went so big. They have huge HP Superdomes. They have huge IBM AIX machines. They've got a ton of Linux machines. Those machines just weren't big enough to handle all those subscribers. So they scaled out horizontally using sharding. And that worked really, really well. It scaled really well. But the problem was they need to design their application to be sharded and they need to maintain that application over time. So they shouted and went really fast, and then a few years later they said, we spend more money on maintenance than we do on the core business. So they came to us and said, we like the horizontal scaling, why don't you somehow do that in the database so that we don't have to incur those maintenance costs? So we said, yeah, sure. <laughs> Took a few years, but we've done that. It's called Time 10 Scale Out. So we took one of the smallest provinces. It's only got 30 million subscribers. It's about the size of T-Mobile. It's a pretty simple app. There's only 800 tables. Oh, they said, oh, by the way, one more thing. We don't want to rewrite our application. They didn't want to change their data model. They didn't want to change their application. And they wanted to scale. And we said, sure. So we did that. The point is, you don't change the data model, you don't change the code. You change your connect string because you're pointing to a different host and port, but beyond that, it all just worked. So they were beta customers. Two weeks after we went production with our product, they went production because they'd been testing it for months, they got bored, and they've been production since June. <coughs> so they went from a very simple two machine active standby type technology to six machines. Each one of those machines was doubled, so they went from <coughs> two machines to six machines, and it went three times faster with no code change, no schema change. So they were pretty happy. Um, this is just a quote, he's saying, we're happy. Now, I've been talking about database scaling. Been talking about vertical scaling, you can only go so far. You know, 
We used all those mainframes because it was simple. We wanted more memory, more CPU. But people couldn't make big enough machines for what we needed. Our customers scaled out horizontally with sharding. It scaled, but they didn't like the availability. So they got us to rewrite our product to give the horizontal scaling while still keeping a single database image without changing their schema, without changing their code. So this, avail this code's available now. Get it OTN. Go Oracle times, I mean, databases times 10. You can download it. It's Linux 64-bit software. So you can run it, you know, it's an honesty thing. You download it. You can use it. We don't care. If you've got a bug, you probably need a customer number. Probably need a license. So where does it work? It's 64 bits Linux. We haven't found a Linux distribution where it doesn't work. So we have customers with you know, really bizarre things like MontaVista, which is carrier gate Linux. You know, for telcos, you need to be up 24 by 7, 365. So we support some of those very specific Linux distributions because that's what our customers run. They need to run it. But you know, Red Hat, Suzy, Ubuntu, it all just works. Um, JDK 8 or later, you know, 9, 10, 11 will work. Um, we use TCP IP over Ethernet. So it pretty much works anywhere. The faster your network card, the better. One gig Ethernet's good. 10 is better. 25 is pretty good. 100 gig eth I mean, Ethernet's even better. So you get what you pay for. So it'll work on bare metal, it'll work on your favorite VM, it'll work in your favorite container, even works on OpenStack. So this is on-prem. In the cloud, it's gonna run in your favorite cloud. You know, there's more clouds than that, but these are the most popular ones. Fundamentally, you gotta set up your cloud, set up your VMs, your compute nodes, download the software. We use Java because we use Zookeeper for a membership service so we don't have a split brain. Unzip it, configure it, and deploy it. So I've done it on all of those clouds, it works. Because it's a distributed database with many, many nodes, you spend more time setting up those compute nodes than you do installing the database. You know, you set up one VM, okay. You set up 50 VMs, it starts getting boring. So we thought, there needs to be a better way. So, if any of you guys are familiar with Terraform, Okay, the point is, it's this technology um, that pretty much works on every cloud. Oracle Cloud's got a plugin for that. So you basically tell, me, tell it, set up some VMs, or set up a bare metal server. This shape, this many CPUs, set up networking this way, just go do it. So you tell it declaratively what you want, so it'll go create it for you. So the point is, if you download this little script we wrote, 100 kilobytes, download the product, you run this Python script, it asks you some questions, or you can pass them as parameters. For a 32 node set up, it'll take about 20 minutes. You spend about a minute typing in options, or passing in parameters, then you go have a coffee. So it's created those VMs, it's installed the databases, it's configured it, and it's up and running. So, I can demo that at the demo station. It's supposed to be available now, it's not, but very soon we're gonna put that on GitHub. So you can run it on-prem, do whatever you want. You can run it in the cloud, manually configuring it. This Terraform thing we're about to release, and by the way, we're gonna release a, a cloud service very soon. So, I've talked about database scaling. I've talked about the limits of vertical scaling. I've talked about different techniques to scale out horizontally. I've talked about the Java JDBC API, which standardizes the way you can do it and makes it goes faster than pretty much any other database. And I said, by the way, if you use a smarter database that uses knowledge of where the data is via SQL, it'll go faster than your favorite language, whether that be Python or Ruby or Go or even C++. So that's what I wanted to talk about. Please ask some questions. Yes, sir. Yep. 
Great question. So that's a long question. Um, so I'm very happy to talk to you. Is there any other shorter questions? And then we'll, we'll go for you. Because how are we doing for time here? OK, so I'm, I'm going to get to your question. Just any other shorter questions first? Excellent question. So if I repeat the question, how will it be available? Will it be part of, you know, PAS or DBAS? So it's available today as a database, as a zip file, download it from OTN. You can run it on-prem, you can FTP that to your favourite cloud, unzip it and install it. We intend to make a database service out of that. It won't be DBAS or Exadata or Autonomous, it's going to be its own thing. Does that answer your question? Cool. Say again? Sure, sure. Any other questions? Because I've got a long question. OK, distribution clauses. Um, with um, tables, we've got three different ways of distributing data. We distribute by hash, which is a consistent hash. We didn't invent this. Everybody uses it. Cassandra, Mongo, it's a pretty standard way of doing it. That way it evenly spreads the data. So you've got one table, you want to spread it over all your machines. Easy to do. If you just do that, it'll work. But when you do a join, when you do an update, it's going to spend all its time shipping rows across the network and messages. OK? So if you've got a relational database doing joins, just having a consistent hash is not great. So we also, I mean, I've got pictures on another slide. You know, we've got other talks on this. Um, quite often you have joins between tables, master detail, primary foreign key. If you have the detail tables on the same machine as the, the master, when you do a join, you're doing it on the same machine. You're doing it on memory, so it can be very fast. So we have distribute by reference. I actually had a slide on that earlier. Yes. OK, time's up. Um, why don't I keep answering your questions? We're getting kicked out. OK, thank you for your time.